All right. Welcome to the Pet Life Podcast. As always, I am Patrick, Where and am today is an exciting one. I've been looking forward to this uh, once I got word from our, uh, our guest here that he was interested and willing to come on the show. Uh, with me today is Mr. Frank Chester. Frank Chester, uh, just as it is, how are you today? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. All right. So I'm going to do less talking today because I want those to, uh, who listen to learn from what uh, Mr. Chester here, Frank, has given us with his uh, creativity, his, uh, his background in math- mathematics, as well as uh, his just wonder in trying to figure the world out. That being said, Frank, yes. what is your background to leading into the bigger picture here? What are some of the things that you've been doing or have done that kind of led you to what we're ultimately talking about today? Well, uh, I, <clears throat> geometry um, really didn't enter my life uh, until I was 60. Um, and the only class that I failed in high school was geometry. <laughs> so <clears throat> I was really better at drawing cartoons than I was using the compass and so forth. So the teacher caught me and failed me. So um, I majored in art. I have a a degree in art. I went to Cranbrook Academy of Art, which was the best school at the time. And then after that, I became a teacher. And I taught uh, in New York and New Jersey and California, Hawaii, um, all the way from elementary school to college. So when I retired um, in 60, I had always planned to do my art. I couldn't do it before because I couldn't make a living. So I reverted, I started to teach, which I really fell in love with after a while. So when I retired at 60, I decided that I would like to go back to college um, and I just take a course or so. So I heard about this one college that taught Girthian science. I took it, and then in that class, there was a lady who explained, you know, a week's class in um, platonic forms. So I was really, really interested. I really liked them. I didn't know about them before. I knew there was a cube and a sphere and things like that. But as far as Plato and all these different people who studied these things, I did not know. So is that kind of what you wanted to hear or? Well, that yeah, so, and that's the, well, this kind of leads into what the, the whole grand scheme is. And you've talked about this in your other lectures of bringing the science and the artistic sides together, which has allowed you as, you, as you mentioned, to get to the place where you are, where you were able to discover what you've discovered and then uh, bring obviously into the material world for people. So. Uh, that definitely is a, is a great start because, as you said, you, you have an art background, um, you know, in that creativity, it sounds, and I'll let you go from here, but uh, was what allowed you to start opening your eyes to bring in those two parts of the brain or two parts of the world together. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> what I discovered, it was, I discovered artistically, not scientifically, artistic. Mm -hmm. Now, I approached the artistically, and I think that's the reason that the form was never found is because they are always looking at it on the other side. Now, when I went to college, I majored um, in art and um, across the street from the art building was the industrial arts building. And so the art people never knew about machines or how to make much except, you know, just clay and paint and like that. So I wanted to learn machines. I wanted to know how to make things with the machine. So I would go across the street and take a class there. And they found out that I was in the art department. And they said, you don't need to be in those clothes. People don't know what they're doing. <laughs> so <laughs> then I would go across, back across the street to the art building and said, why are you taking any of those classes? Those people don't know how to design. They have no idea uh, about any artistic uh, approaches to things. And so I went behind 
you know, back and forth across the street for quite a while. <laughs> and in that process, I am so glad I did it because I learned both sides. Right. So to find what to, um, I tried science first on this problem. The problem was, is that the lady told me there was no seven sided form. Right. And so, you know, to me, I, I wondered why, because the people have been doing this for, you know, thousands and thousands of years. People have been working on these forms. And they said there was an eight-sided form, the octahedron, and there was a six-sided form, which is the cube. I thought, well, there's got to be a seven between six and eight. And no, no such thing. There's never, uh, there is no seven-sided form. So that's kind of how I started. Right. was with that question hey how come you know well what's the deal here you guys I, I, you haven't got the right books or what absolutely well <laughs> it's, it's it's beautiful how curiosity and wonder from the the creative side really allows us to uh open our eyes and start looking as they would say outside the box so i'm, I'm yeah, totally right. with you. um so maybe while we're because we're going into a little bit more so we're talking about the chestahedron so for those who don't know what the chestahedron is, and you kind of already alluded to it and explained, what, what is the chestahedron? Well, it's a, it's a, um, a form that has seven sides, seven points, um, and it has 12 edges. And all of the forms, the faces of this form are equal area. Now, all platonic forms have equal areas, but they have one polygon. The Chesterhedon has two polygons, okay, but they're equal in area. And that's exactly what I was trying to find was a seven-sided form that had equal area. And through this process, um, I found that, and I called the Chesterhedon uh, because um, basically I found the form was in the chest. And so, so instead of a tetrahedron or an octahedron, I call it chestahedron. Absolutely. So it's got it's 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 a it's a beautiful form never seen before uh, in the history of form. Yeah, and that's a beautiful thing. And then for those who may or may not have a visualization of what it is, it's actually right behind his head uh, in that blue form right there. That you are you are very observant. That's exactly what that is. I didn't I, mean to have. Oh no, it here. I love it. I, uh, this is the form in just uh, edges, you know, yeah. no face, whatever. But you're right, that blue right there I, is the Chetahedron. I've been, like I said, I've been, uh, I've been w listening and reading and watching a lot of your stuff for about a year now. So I've become, in many ways, as familiar as I can from the information that I've uh, that you've put out there, and also uh, very familiar with uh, Dr. Tom Cowan's work. Um, listen, you know, to your podcast with him and just so much great information and one of the things that really brought my attention towards you um, and we can go into this more is I have a background in the arts and uh, filmmaking and acting but also in the personal training world so they my my mindset is very that as you said the science and the artistic and what I've done in so many ways and continue to try to do is bring those two worlds together because as we know, the body um, is more than what we're told, uh, specifically speaking about the heart. And that's something that really opened my eyes to uh, just the, the perfect design in which we are. And then obviously uh, learning from Dr. Tom Cowan about, you know, we're not really having a pump in the body, but it's these, vortex, these vortex that's occurring. And then obviously with your work, you demonstrate and show what's going on there with the, the chest hedron. So, uh, we take this in so many directions, but maybe starting off with uh, when we look at the chestahedron, you said it has it has two uh, polygons, correct? As yeah. well as, but it's a seven sided form. How did you how did you put those two together? How did you um, bring that to life? Like I know you you've talked about this before um, in other uh, podcasts and lectures, but I know it's two different forms that you put together, connecting them, correct? Yes. So can maybe describe for the people who are looking at it or, or not, can't see it exactly how I do, uh, 
how would you describe that to somebody just so they can see it visually? Do you have, do you happen to have on hand those, the two different pieces to show them how they come together? Or is that, I don't know if you have them on, if not, no worries. I just know that a lot of our uh, viewers who are watching visually like to see this. Yeah. Well, there is a, a pentagram, a six pointed star, a five pointed star. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then <clears throat> what I did was I took this, this form uh, and I fold it together. Mm -hmm. I fold it together and so there were only four kites. And I call these kites because they, they look like kites, you know. Okay, and so I made that. <clears throat> And here it is, three-dimensionally. There are the four, which I folded together. Mm -hmm. I got a square bottom, yeah, and four kites. You can see the kite, I think, yep. pretty good. Yep. Okay, so what I did is I continued to fold it to more together. Okay, and then I only had three kites. Yep. And that looks like this. Now, when you have only three kites from the five-pointed star pentagram, okay, um, it makes um, a triangle at the bottom, not a square, and triangles on the other three sides hmm. and three kites. So there's seven. And it happens to be that the kite and the triangle have the same area. And that black that you see on three of the sides in the bottom is the tetrahedron. And the tetrahedron is the first form that comes into the world. And it, I have found that what happens is the tetrahedron opens up. Okay, that's why there's a distance between my fingers. Mm -hmm. The tetrahedron has opened up until it gets to the five, which is the three kites. Mm -hmm. and makes a seven-sided form and that has never been seen in the world before wow and just just think of you know the tetrahedron yeah. is the first form that comes into the world no other form comes into the world three-dimensionally before the tetrahedron and it holds the least amount of volume of any of the platonic forms now What's amazing about that is that nobody has ever opened up the tetrahedron. Nobody ever has done it in the history. They've never opened it up. Hmm. And of course, if you continue to open it up, other forms appear also. But <clears throat> at this particular point, where the five kites folded into three fit exactly, a tetrahedron opened up. This is amazing, you know, you know, huh? I couldn't do this. I mean, I, I can't lay in bed and figure this out. Right. I had to go through an awful lot of processes to find this, but they were artistic. And that's what's so important. The artistic approach to science. Okay. Actually, if you think about it, it should come first. And most of the time it has throughout the history of geometry, the geometry has always been ahead of the math, okay? And the math catches up. Yep. Interesting, isn't it? I Does think that help to explain how that- Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's the fascinating thing for me, um, especially with what in the, the world we live in today, not even just about the last two years, but in general, there's a lot of people through my experience and my observation with working with clients where you see these bright people, but they're, there's a missing component of their artistic side in their words, not mine is I wish I was able to follow my creative endeavors like you do, or think cause that a lot of them knew what I, that I did the training or the, the acting world as well. And what really started hearing over and over again is people going, they're not able to express themselves creatively. And you're seeing that, yeah, they might have the intelligence within the framework of what, you know, science is explaining, but just to what to your point and what you're doing is that ability to open your eyes to something new and wonder and, and, and curiosity and going, Hey, wait a minute. What if I did this? You know, it's never been done. Okay. Let me just try. Let me see what happens. 
And as you said, and as you've made it clear here, and what has always struck a chord with me listening to your lectures and everything else is going, that's it. It is the artistic side that's ahead of the math and the math follows. Because yeah, as you it, it, I, when I first found this, <clears throat> I showed it to the mathematicians, okay? And they said, oh, that's just too artistic. <laughs> yeah. And then I showed it to the artists and they said, oh, that's too mathematical. Yep. So the thing is, is that <clears throat> in relationship to what I just said, that's the basis of the human heart and what it's going through. It's going through these two polarities and what the human heart does and what we need to do for the heart is to bring two polarities together into a middle space that allows you to have a problem. You go artistic. If the art doesn't work, then you go to the math. If the math doesn't work and back and forth. And then you start to find something. But if you just stick on one side or the other, mm -hmm. you're stuck. Absolutely. And, and let's dive into the heart here a little bit, if we may, because I love that you bring it up and it, what you're showing us with the chestahedron is in fact, because a lot of people have a misconception of what the heart looks like and what the heart is, as silly as it sounds, some people still think the heart is this, the picture they show you on Valentine's Day. Some people actually believe that that's still the heart, unfortunately. Yeah, they do. They do. So what, when you talk about the heart, are, uh, maybe to clarify here, the heart is actually a seven-sided form. It is a chestahedron, just to make it clear as day. Yes, it is. I mean, but the problem is that for most people is that my heart doesn't look like this. I've never seen a picture of, course. of a heart that <laughs> has a point and has got these kites and so forth. But the problem is, is that you don't realize, you don't get stuck as to how does nature take geometry and make it organic? How does it go from inorganic to organic? And it's a natural process called minimum surfaces. So this is the minimum surface of the chestahedron. And I'll show it. I can see that's kind of hard, but I'll show you a colored one. Yep. Okay, this is the chestahedron in minimum surfaces. And that is what the heart looks like. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I'm showing you, you know, a, a, here's a small picture that shows you the heart. Yep. Okay, the one yep. I'm holding, and then the one on the far end is both the right and left, and in the middle is this. Yep. Okay, and so then they say, well, how do you get this out of that? Well, what you do <clears throat> is you take a chestahedron and you blow a bubble in it. And that bubble, okay, is the chestahedron. It's a seven-sided bubble, and it's bowed out because it's trying to become a sphere. And all geometric forms are trying to go back to the original shape of the sphere because the sphere holds the most surface areas for the, for the surface. Mm -hmm. And so everything is striving to go. This is why all these the planets are all circular. So there's the chestahedron, okay? Yep. The white lines are the chestahedron, and the minimum surfaces in the middle is the uh, organic shape that nature forces a, a geometric shape into. So if you <clears throat> go back to this, this is the bubble. Mm -hmm. This is minimum surfaces of the heart. So now you can realize that yes, this is not the shape of the heart, but this is. Yep. And and what's so f and I love that. And what's so fascinating to me, and as I said, you've talked about this before, and as much as I enjoy people watching this show, I do highly, highly recommend going on uh, YouTube, going on Frank's website and looking, listening to these other lectures because he's, he has more forms that he can show. Um, there's so much information he gets to bring. So if we don't cover it here, or if you want more clarity, they're there as well. I highly recommend people going there because as you said, this hasn't been found before. It hasn't been discussed. And for my opinion, I wish and I hope more people find interest in this because as we'll go into it later about what actually effects this could have on understanding uh, where the heart is in regards to diseases and um, you know well-being essentially of where the, where the heart is. Um, but uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. I, I kind of want to go back to, as you blew up the form of the chestahedron, 
maybe going into how you, because you talked about in other lectures, how you were able to move the different surface areas, but also the different corners and lines to start to create these different forms, uh, these different patterns, shapes uh, through time. You so um, you were talking about how when you started pushing the corners in, it started creating a concave like uh, within the structure uh, compared to uh, convex. Do you remember what I was talking? Do you know what I'm? Am I making myself clear? I, I it's it's still hard to break it down. Well, um, uh, so you are you want me to talk about a little bit of how I started to find this form? Yes. Yeah. That, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh, no, 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 you're perfectly clear. It's just I have to think it out. So, um, <clears throat> okay, the first thing I did um, was I did what one scientist told me when I showed him the Chattahedon for the first time. And he said, how'd you do that? I said, well, I, I started with... Uh, a piece of clay and seven sticks. And he said, that's the trouble with you people from, from America. You don't know what doesn't work. So what he meant was, is that I didn't know better than to do this because it wouldn't work, okay? But because I did do this and didn't know that it wouldn't work, I saw there was an opportunity here to find something new. So why this doesn't work is because if I attach triangles to all of these sticks at the end, the form comes out to be 10 sides. Well, that's not right. How can you have seven sticks and have 10 sides? It's stupid. It makes, it should have seven, but it doesn't. So that means that three of these sticks, okay, <clears throat> I got a be taken out. Okay, well, uh, that doesn't make any sense to me because the seven-sided form has to have seven vertices or corners. So when I decided to take these sticks out, okay, there are seven holes. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's pretty good. There are seven holes. Now there are seven holes. So now I decide what I'll do is I'll start carving out the holes like volcanoes, and then maybe I would have a seven-sided form. So I did that. Well, <clears throat> when I when when I made all the circles, some of the circles wouldn't touch, and all those would, because um, it, it 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 doesn't work uh, oh. perfectly geometrically with circles. So. This is what happened is that when I got to that point, there were gaps where the circles wouldn't come together. Well, artists don't care about gaps. We just keep going. Right. We just keep carving. We don't stop there. I mean, I'm a sculptor, so it was easy for me. That's what I like to do. So <clears throat> I kept going. And all of a sudden, as soon as the circles touched, there became an edge. And so I kept pushing all these different edges together and I got all triangles inside, 42 of them, 42 triangles created when I started to move these circles. And when the circles touched, they made an edge. Hmm. 42 triangles, I couldn't believe it. So when I got the 43 triangles, okay, I was just thinking if I had, one here that I could show you. Let me, just give me a minute. Yeah, no worries. We're gonna, yeah, we'll pause real quick. This is the original form that I made you know, with those holes, okay. And as I carved them in, all these became triangles. So this side had one, two, three, four, five, six, no, five, one, two, three, four, five, and this side had three, one, two, three, had three triangles, one, two, three. And then this had one, two, three. I'm sorry. Then this had four, one, two, three, four. I was upset because I wanted all of them to be three. And then this one turned out to four. And then when I thought about it, well, how three and four are seven. So what am I complaining about? Yeah. So anyway, I went as far as I could. 
Okay, and got these shapes. And I took plaster of Paris, cups of plaster of Paris. I had seven cups, all the same height and, and volume. And I poured them in each one of these holes. This one is four. Mm -hmm. And this one is three. Yep. And I poured them in there. And then I, I, got, I let them get solid. And I took them out and put them back together. This is stuff for everyone listening that is you, if you're not already totally in, this is what got me. So proceed. <laughs> and this is what I pulled out the original. This is the original chestahedron. Wow. This is the plaster of Paris. I put them together and I got this shape. Well, it's not accurate at all. I mean, these, these tetrahedrons are not right. And, uh, you know, either are the kites, the kites of the tetrahedrons, but it's close. It yeah. was. It was something, it was something, that's the seven-sided form I'm holding, but it's, you know, a little weird and it's not very accurate and whatever. But as you know, I studied and studied this and now I have it perfect. Uh, it's so wonderful. And let me ask from more of like a, a, a personal emotional side of it. When you came to that and you realized that, like, what was the emotion for you? Like, what was it more like a fire under you or was it more like a, in awe, like what was that kind of experience? Because I can only imagine. I couldn't sleep for days. <laughs> I um, get it. And then after that, I didn't sleep because more and more information came to me. All of a sudden, <clears throat> before uh, it was just sort of a, I was kind of in a, you know, vacuum or I'm just kind of, uh, you know, playing around. But then once that happened, all these ideas started to flood in on me. And I couldn't keep up with it, <clears throat> and I lost sleep. And then I had to say, I had to say to my son, "Now, just a minute. So you got to stop this. You got to take care of yourself, and just stop this once in a while and rest." And so once I did that, then I went back to my regular sleep. But I was absolutely uh, enthralled. I was inspired. I was absolutely high as a kite yeah. based on finding this form. Absolutely. The question is right. Listen, <clears throat> if you take up this kind of work, no matter what it's filmmaking or acting or whatever, if you take that same kind of discovery process that you're trying to find, oh boy, it changes your life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, and I couldn't agree more. And I haven't solved anything like you have by any means, but what thing that I think is important in what we're talking about in this, the umbrella of this conversation is that back and forth, as you said, that polarities of the science and the artistic side of self, because as you just made clear, and I, I've been there, when you're in the artistic mindset, the creative side, you can get so far into it that, again, it is affecting your health. It is affecting your biology because you're so in, in, in what they would say, the cloud or in the, the etheric side of it and not in your body, right? Losing sleep, losing the ability to, you know, need what your body needs to basically be well. Um, so it is finding that appropriate balance where most people now are, in the lack of better terms, they're just the science of like, oh, okay, I'm not really gonna think much about it or I don't really wanna go see where that takes me, you know, in my thoughts. And so most people are in their body, but unfortunately most people's bodies as we will talk here today, um, are not doing so well is on top of it. So you're in your body, but it's not doing so hot as well as the, the lack of being able to connect the creative side too. So I just, I, I, and I'll repeat myself again and again, that's what has really drawn me to your work. Um, other than the fact that you found and uh, developed something that is pure and true as can be, it's that ability to bring those worlds together. Um, I love it. So maybe while we're talking about the creative side, you say you're a sculptor. What, what so, um, how do you uh, implement uh, all these sacred geometry, the chestahedron, into your your work? Have you been? Um, I know you have a lot of uh, sculptings that you've done, but are you specific? Like, I have to implement sacred geometry, or kind of how is your process with the with that? I mean, today, like, what I mean, what am I doing right yeah. now? Yeah, yeah. Like you say, you're a sculptor. Is that is that something you're still doing at the moment? Oh my gosh, yes. I'll never give it up. No, 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 it's never going to stop because um, I've found so many things to uh, discover about this one form. I've been working 22 years on this, this form 
and I'm only starting to scratch the surface of what's going on here. Um, and especially with the heart, uh, that's my main concentration is what this form is telling me. I'm not telling it what it's telling me about its qualities. Mm -hmm. And in that I have found that it is basically the left ventricle of the human heart. What does it show me that the science world um, and, uh, you know, uh, cardiologists, what the, how does that relate to what they're doing? And what I have found is that Chesterhedron is a new tool. It's a new tool in a toolbox. And in that toolbox, if I look at what the cardiologists is, I, I look, they dissect, okay, they, they, they x-rays, they, they do magnet work with MIRs, they do, they do um, sound now, um, mm -hmm. they use all of these four or five different methods to try to find out more about the heart, okay. And so my work comes along and it's another tool. That's all it is. It's not trying to make anything that they've done wrong or right or anything. It doesn't, the chat doesn't care about that. <clears throat> it just wants to speak through me what it does, what it can do. Okay, and so I have found out answers that they cannot find. And why they can't find it? Because they need the seven-sided form. And if they don't have this vortex type form, all they can do is just take things apart or you know, try to find something that they can't see with x-rays and magnets and sound. But they don't understand the form. They don't understand what they're seeing. So that's what Chester Hayden comes along and does and helps them to see, see this, for instance, this. This is the Chestahedron here. And how does the Chestahedron move? Well, I found out how it moves. And you see that? That's the way the outside of the heart moves. And they don't, they, all they know is that the sides sort of bow out on the outside. But, but mm -hmm. why? I mean, what for and how much and what angle? And I have answers for those things. Now, what's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, that I started out with the sticks and mud and, now I have cardiologists interested in my work. My it's, God, it's amazing. I have no idea. I have no connection with the heart. But the thing is, you have connection with your creativity, which um, I don't know what your beliefs or your your viewpoints of God are. But it, you know, the universe. I mean, you're as you said, it's speaking through you, and it's when you can allow yourself and give yourself permission to allow that information to flow through you. Um, it's something wild. Like that's like any musician or, or artist. Sometimes they're just like, I don't know where it came from. It just kind of came through me, and I just put it into the material world. Um, and that's exactly, yeah. So let me just comment on what you said. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So uh, there's a process that I've found that works, and the the first thing that the human being does when it's born and it's small and young is that it imitates, mm -hmm. it imitates the mother, wow, well, she walks, how, well, she talks, well, everything is learned from imitation, there's nothing wrong with that, it's perfect. After about the, around 12 or so, uh, the child starts to um, <clears throat> kind of be on its own, and it starts to innovate. Mm -hmm. And so innovation is just a higher form of copying. So if you're in an artist state and you're imitating, okay, you're innovating, you're just still imitating. You're still using the crayons in the, in the color book. Okay, so if you can get to the point where you can use your imagination, then images start to work from you in any field you go into. So the imagination is the next step after innovation. And if you can imagine then you can find something that inspires you. And that inspiration is, is what leads you into new directions and new, and a new life and an excited life and whatever. And that until you have the inspiration, you only then can have intuition. And intuition is the highest that you want to reach because that's not coming. Okay, that's coming from what you just explained. 
you want to call it God, you want to call it whatever. Right. It's intuition. Now, intuition isn't just women's and hysterical women. Absolutely not. That's not what intuition is. Intuition is being able to be helped, okay, to bring the inspiration to continue inspiration and to keep moving and moving. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, okay, it changes your life. Yep. Once you have the intuition, because then you have intuitive things all around you that before you didn't have. Like I can see forms and I don't even have to make them anymore. I can, I can, I, mean, I, I don't have to go through this struggle. I can make them immediately. I can make them within, I can make a new form in two hours. But I don't because I got to do the chest of heathen and then what do I want another form in my house? I got enough. So, <clears throat> so the intuition is what you're, what you're getting at. And that intuition can come no matter what you tackle. Like I said, either as an actor or Absolutely. as a writer, whatever. That intuition is what you're looking for. I couldn't agree more. And I, I actually say a lot of the times that intuition is the, what the sixth sense that we uh, they don't tell us about or they choose to leave out because it is such a powerful tool. Um, as you know, most people kind of bringing it back to the heart and all the stuff that you're bringing up is, and I talk about in my field a lot is, is um, you know that the gut, gut instincts, you know, your intuition, you feel the gut feeling, a lot of this stuff is communication. As they say are in the science world now that, you have the the brain in your gut. You have a the, you know a brain in your heart. Like it's not just up here, and it's this forever communication of those three hearts basically going through one another. And I actually am under the belief I don't know for certain, but that your gut is well, it's the heart first, and then the gut has that extra component, and then it's the mind. Now I could be wrong here, but as we know, that heart space and what you gathered with your work is so so powerful. As they say, hey, like, follow your heart, you know, your heart will lead you, you know, we have all these phrases and words that people don't really, we can't comprehend because we don't have, I think, the tools to fully grasp how powerful those words are, or those phrases, or gut instincts. Um, you know, it's like, hey, man, I just have this churning in my gut. Yeah, that's, it's speaking to you. We look at it as, oh, my, something's wrong. It's like, no, this is, this is a communication process. This communication process is much bigger than just this material world. And for me, with my job and knowing with all of the, you know, the stuff that they put in, in the air and our water and our food, how much that's actually scientifically affecting our gut biome, affecting that communication process where we would get a lot of our intuition of like, hey, I, yeah, same thing with the heart, you know, understanding how, you know, what's causing plaque buildups, truly causing plaque buildups. Um, it starts to make you realize like, oh, we're just, we're just minimizing or turning down the volume of this communication process that allows intuition to really shine through, which in my opinion is why most people nowadays go, oh man, I just, I wish I could be creative. I wish I can follow those creative endeavors, even if it's just a hobby and people don't do it. Cause a lot of times they go, how do you think like that? It's like, you can too. I just, I, I don't know how else to say you can. It's, it's, it's within your vessel it's within your structure it's within your etheric body everything about you it has the potential it's just a matter of not how you can get there as you said learning how to get to it yeah and i you know and just tell a little bit about intuition one of the things that you have to realize is that in the old days <clears throat> thousands of years ago 500 years ago whatever uh, a lot of things like if you take uh, mozart um <clears throat> if you ever watch that movie you will see that the music is coming from and into and from him. Okay, so what is coming to him is coming into him. That's not going to work anymore in the world because <clears throat> that kind of inspiration type of work isn't there anymore. Now, today, today what we have to do is what what we do has to come from us, not to through us. Things can't go through us anymore. Things now have to come from us. And the reason that I say this is because uh, all of the nature that you see in the world was left behind for us to learn from. That's what nature is all about, to learn what is behind the flower, what's behind this, what's behind that. And nature can give you that. But if you just 
paint apples. That's just not enough. Okay, we just we painted enough apples. Okay, what we have to do is not just see what there's outside, okay, and then copy it. We have to find what's outside and find out what can come from us because we can learn from nature and what comes from us is what they're waiting for. That's what that's what's needed. It's the things that come from us as human beings. And that's why the human being is so important because the whole future of the world. The whole future of humanity is what comes from us. Well, so I couldn't have said that any better. And I love every bit about that. And it oh. shows it shows with what you're doing with your work is what you're saying, what you're expressing. I know that to be true, even though I've never met you. This is our first time really having any conversation, but I can feel it, right? This is intuitively like I can feel the words, what you're saying, but the energy behind it. And that's a huge part that I think people can't fully comprehend. And I hope more people do. It seems like people are from at least my experiences is they're starting to get like, let me follow the energy behind what someone's saying rather than what they're just saying. You know, it's like, it's, you know, as they say, it's not what you said, it's how you said it, right? <laughs> it's the energy that comes behind it. And that's opening people's mind to vibrations and frequencies um, in, in being able to at least comprehend that from the sense of like, okay, I didn't learn this growing up but I'm willing to listen because this does make sense. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm at that point now where I've just opened myself to being like, let me take out any information that comes in and also pay attention to any response that I have to that information. How do I then project that energy back out? Well, it's so nice to talk to you. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, do you have to run at this exact moment? Sorry. What's that? Oh, so you don't have to run at this exact moment, oh, do you? No, oh, okay. I'm just, no, I'm just telling you, I'm just, you know, listening oh. to you. I'm just telling you that it's so nice to talk to you. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I had someone, real quick, I had someone do that in the past. Like, it was a good talk. And I'm like, oh, we're done. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Yeah, so I just wanted to make sure. I'm not done. No. Um, well, thank you so much. But yeah, so, and, and I feel the same way. And what's great about um, this conversation and conversations like these is, at least from the responses I've gotten from people is, it, it is getting people more into that place where they're going to ask more questions, allow themselves to, you know, basically pull that door open of allowing the light of creativity to come through and be like, oh yeah, maybe I can't think of it this way. And people will start reaching out to me through my conversations with uh, guests asking questions. And it's similar to what you were saying about uh, once you kind of realize that uh, the form was coming together, like I couldn't sleep and there's this exciting, it's invigorating. Nothing you know, like it. Yeah. And here's the thing. I grew up like similar to you, like math was not my strong suit. I was, I, I got by, I did good because I was able to remember what I needed to remember. But it, I knew for a fact compared to other classes, I didn't have that spark of a fire to want to be like, I want to learn this. And as I've gotten older and with your work and other people I've, I've come across and listened to, I realized I'm like, oh my gosh, math. And, and the form and these shapes and geometry, everything is such a beautiful thing. Why wasn't this taught to me? Because I know for a fact, me, I'd be like, I got questions. I got to go out and I want to look more into this. So, you know, not to make it in a, uh, like a conspiracy route, but like, why do you think we're not getting this information if it is out there? As you said, it's all in nature. <laughs> <clears throat> well, um, I think a lot of that has to do with the way when we were brought up and educated. <clears throat> education is education is basically a, doesn't inspire you to do anything like this because it's not inspiring. Right. And the reason is is because the teachers aren't inspired. Okay. And that's the that's the main problem is is it just is the teacher taught the teacher and the teacher became a teacher and taught that teacher and taught those students and then those students became teachers and those teachers. It just goes on and on. How come sure. that so much, how come it's taken so long to find this chest of heat? How come it's taken so long to realize that the heart isn't what you appear, what it appears to be? Um, I mean, why is that? You got all these doctors who are supposed to be really smart and so forth, you know, and, and it's working out that um, <clears throat> maybe they're just good at taking tests. I, I don't know what it is. Uh, maybe they're really good at memorizing to get through this school that they have to get through. Regurgitation. 
Yeah, very much a regurgitation process. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, and, and this is just why I think it's, it's important. You know, I have my views and my opinions on it for sure. Um, and it is unfortunate that we, as you said, it's a system where it's just trying to get by, like, let me just do what I'm told in order to succeed. And that's, that's our uh, outlook on what succeeding is, unfortunately, in this education system is going, you know, hey, just do what you're told. Like I got, I, I got not in trouble, but teachers weren't happy when I would always go, wait, hold on, I got a question. And they were like, dude, just like, I got to get through the lesson, man. And I was like, but I, I genuinely have a question. I thought we were supposed to be in this class to learn. Like I got some questions and, uh, right. you know, that's right. And that's so for me that early on, you know, I was good in school, but it was realizing shortly, I'm like, I'm just, they're just trying to get through uh, the material. And I was like, all right, if that's what we're doing, then I guess that's what we're doing. And I would just kind of sometimes stop talking, but even still, like there was that, that, that in my gut, I was like, hey, oh, I got, I got a question. And they're like, oh my gosh, Patrick, what's the question, man? <laughs> um, but you know, what, what is cool and what I find super um, inspiring is that more people are starting to ask questions. And it, you're, we're finding it in other forms. It's not necessarily within the schooling system. It is through technology. Um, as much as people want to bash it, there is this ability to have these types of conversations and hear um, from others on a bigger scale um, and reaching more people with that information. And I think this is important more than ever now. Maybe let's bring it back to the heart, if you're cool with that, is that we're seeing a lot of people dealing with a lot of heart complications at the moment. Um, obviously, chronic uh, ischemic disease is the biggest one, heart attacks, uh, clogged arteries, all that's occurring um, like we've never seen before. And with what you said earlier and you kind of were just alluding to with how the heart works with that pump, maybe describe what you're showing there in the vortexes that occur with that. And then also maybe we can show then or explain how the different shaping and forming that occurs could be alluding to potential risks of heart disease. I know you've talked about this in the past but maybe let's start with the heart itself. And as you're going through that pumping mode or pumping motion, what what what's basically what's truly occurring there? You just talked about it with like vortexes and things like that. But I thought maybe we can take our, our path that way. Cause that I want before we do wrap, I do want to make sure we go over a lot of that. Well, um, you know. To me, there, there's people who say that the heart is a pump, and then there are people that say that the heart isn't a pump. But neither side that says that, uh, no one comes out and say, where is it then? Mm -hmm. Is it both of them? Is it combination, or is it one or the other? Well, if it's not one or the other, uh, what is it? Okay, then nobody has the answer. I mean, nobody has really come out and said anything that it isn't this or is this. So to me, that's not enough. So, and, and the reason I said it is because of what I've been working on with this. Okay, so, <clears throat> okay. Uh, the chest of actually is a vortex. Okay. And so the vortex has become very popular lately. And that's fine, that's good. But they don't know the geometry behind a vortex. I mean, there's a geometry behind it and nobody knows what that is. And so the Chess Hayden was the first, to me, the first geometry that showed the, uh, what a vortex is. So if I take the Chess Hayden like this, okay, and I have it here, and if I spin it, there's the vortex. That's the geometry of the vortex. Wow. Look at that. All straight lines are be becoming curves. Isn't that amazing? Look, those are curves. That's incredible. Okay. So, you know, that started me out. And so the inside of the heart and the outside of the heart move differently. The outside of the heart moves, expands and contracts. Okay. It moves like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the inside doesn't do that. The inside reverses itself like this. Mm -hmm. So how does that happen? Well, the, the myofiber, the cardiomyofibers um, are like rubber bands. 
And when it twists in one direction, it stretches part of the myofibers, which makes it want to retract and come back. And that's basically how this movement is happening. So according to my work, what's moving this movement and what's closing and opening the valves is the blood, not the heart. Mm -hmm. The blood is opening and closing the valves. Because if you look at valves in the heart, they're like parachute. They have cords, okay? And when the blood wants to go this direction, the cords hold them back. But when the, when the blood wants to come in instead of go out, the parachute opens. So what is this very thin leaflets? They're, they're called leaflets because they're like leaves. What causes these leaflets to open and close? The heart can't do that. The blood can. So what happens is inside the, inside the heart, there's this shape. So, um, and this is the outside. And inside there, this is what's happening inside the heart, which is amazing what's happening inside there. Look at what happens inside the heart. Yeah. And you see that twisting? Yeah. Okay, that's a vortex that's reversing. Yeah. That's so fascinating. Freaking amazing. All right. So when it reverses, this is what happens. I made this model, and this model shows what happens when the inside twists like that. Mm -hmm. So this is the mitral valve, and this is the aortic valve, and one's you know almost twice as big as the other. Mm -hmm. All right, so for the blood to come in, it has to go in this direction that I have arrows, but to go out, it has to go in the opposite direction. And this is, this is what, the, what happens with the blood. So if I turn this one uh, clockwise, this one should turn counterclockwise. And it does. Wow. Okay? Yeah. And they don't know how this happens. None of the, art, the, the heart specialists know what's the mechanism behind this. Now, inside here, there's no pulleys, there's no, there's no gears, there's no belts. Okay, there's the twisting that's going on that I just showed you with the tetrahedron. Now you have to remember that this movement going clockwise and counterclockwise, opposite, okay, is happening in less than one second the rest of your life. So what is causing that to do that? Not the heart, it's the blood. blood yeah. Now the blood okay, has an essentially designed the heart to do what it needs to do. And what it needs to do is reverse. Because if you turn this direction, it allows the blood to go in and the valve to open. But at the same time, this direction closes the vortex in this direction and the valve closes. So in, now it can't go out. It can't go out. It can only go in until it reverses. And now it's going out and this is closed. Wow. And these are vortexes. This is a vortex, just like I just showed you. So the blood is doing the work that uh, the, uh, actually the, the heart is doing the work the blood needs to do. Right. And now, that's amazing. It's so that They, they don't know how this happens. They don't know how this happens. And it happens in less than one second throughout your life. It happens in the point uh, zero 0.09, not 10, but nine, nine tenths of a second. Wow. So I have found out how this works. I've found out how to make something that actually does it just like this. I mean, people don't know how I did this. Wow. No, there's no gears in here. Okay, so... Um, that's one aspect that's so important for people to understand about the heart is that it's a three-dimensional moving in three dimensions at the same time. So it's actually bringing the heart forces bring in the balance of the third dimensional world, which is what we live in. So 
there's a balance between going up and down, going right and left, and forward and backwards. Those three directions, which is X, Y, Z in the math, okay, is what the heart does. The heart is a balancing organ for the human being to be able to cope with the experiences of the world that the blood is going through. That's wild. That is, uh, my, my mind is blown. I love this. I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. This is, this is it. And I have a, a video. I, I hope I can do this. I did this just for you. Yeah. For you. I don't oh, know. I love I'm it. I'm be able to show this. It's your I might be able to. So here yeah. I'm going to try, okay? Yeah, give it a go. I'm going to show you a model that I made, okay, of this action. I love it. Okay, so um, I, I'm showing you both the inside and the outside moving at the same time. Nobody's ever made anything like this. And so so let, let's see if I can get it to work. I'll just wait a minute and then I'm going to try to twist it around and show you. There it is. Yeah. Wow. You see the insides and the outside moving yep. in different directions? Yeah. At yep. the same time. Okay, now you can't make any model, any form, anything ever discovered in the past that will do that. You need the chestahedron. So the Chester Heaton is, I don't have to back up anything. The Chester Heaton is, I'm just trying to reinforce people in a way to understand that this, there is a seven-sided form and it's equal surfaces and it's, it's balancing the human being. This is one of the great things that I found a while ago is x-rays, they took x-rays. See, remember I told you they study x-rays mm -hmm. and they say that the front of the heart Okay, if you take a, a, a photo, an x-ray, the front of the heart is at 45 degrees. And the side is also 45 degrees. And the top is also 45 degrees. But we live in a three-dimensional world, not just two, because they say that the heart sits in the body at 45 degrees. It doesn't. It fits at root three. And root three is the distance. Okay, so there's there's the front, mm -hmm. there's the side, there's the front, and there's the top. Oops, oops, like this. So the top is 45 degrees. Yes, that's right, they're right. The front is 45 degrees, that's right. And the side is 45 degrees, but it's really root two, I mean root three. And this is root three, it's at 36 degrees, okay? And this is the balancing center of the human heart working three-dimensionally in three directions at the same time and reaching a balance so that we can work with the polarities, that we can adjust to the polarities because this earth experience is all about barriers. And every barrier that we encounter is there for us to learn from. The barrier is not there for any, even our sickness are based on a gift that we've gotten so we can work on that, on that sickness. And this is the, what the heart does. And it does it through balancing at root three. And of course, I found that the chest of Hedon fits perfectly into a cube. Can you, can you, and, and you say it sits at the 36 degree angle? Yeah, let me show you. That'd be awesome. For those watching, highly, if you haven't been inspired already, go look up his work. So here's the chest of Hedman in a cube. Awesome. Okay, just like what I explained. From here to here is root three. Mm -hmm. You see, there's a red line, a red straw. Yep. I got right through yep. it, right? And the chest of Hedman fits in a cube. Okay, you have to remember that the chest of Hedman is a transitional form between an octahedron and a cube. And if I keep twisting this form, it turns into this. It's not something, this isn't something I invented. This right. is what this geometry is showing. Mm -hmm. And if you think, okay, the heart is, uh, this is what the scientists say, the heart is a football. And when the heart goes into congestive heart failure, it becomes a basketball. That's the best they can do with knowing what form the, the heart is. A football, a heart doesn't have a point on both ends. No. has a point only on one end oh come on give me other words i'm trying to help i'm not trying to hinder or criticize i'm trying to help 
not only the science side, but the artistic side too, because we need both of those things, both the art and the science. We need all the barriers that we run into in our world because the heart is the balance of polarities. Oh my gosh. I love that. That was amazing. And it's, it, and what is so fascinating and just gets me so just jacked up is that you're showing us, you're saying, look, here's my words, but physically look at what I'm saying. And it, as you said, it's sound. You don't have to speak for it. The Chesahedrons are doing that. The fact that you found it though, gives that extra component where you can then speak about it. You can give more to it. You can bring this, this glow to it, this artistic glow to it. And that's what's so, for me, going back to inspiration is, and intuition is like, it's inspiring and intuitively. I'm like, yes, this makes sense. Yes, it does make sense. And the Chesahedron is the answer to how this moves. There is in another form, like I said before, in the world or, or before or after so far yep. that explains this. And I mean, that, that's just, that's unbelievable. And it's, and when you, and I know you were saying that you've talked to mathematicians and, and you've maybe talked to the science field. Have you brought this and you're saying that they're willing to take in your, your model to implement it more into what they're doing have you got any sort of feedback in that regard well i've been doing i found that the the, the chest of heat is basically the heart in 2002 okay and now at 20 years later um i have 200 lectures on youtube mm -hmm. worth it and i have no one knocking at my door and i have no inner i don't have any i don't have any um, encouragement or any involvement or any contact uh, that has led to anybody else doing anything. Nothing. I'm talking zero. I'm not. Ta I'm talking zero. I mean, you think oh, I'm exaggerating? I had, I had two doctors that were interested. One just wanted the form, and the other one just couldn't understand it. Couldn't couldn't grasp it. Okay. And then that doctor tried to show some other doctors um, basically what I did. And then those doctors never contacted me. And then the mathematician was supposed to look at the seven-sided form and see the, the math behind it and never contacted me. And these are famous people, famous doctors and famous mathematicians, zero. And it's, uh, listen, I'm not, all you have to do is just take the chest of heat and get your compass out and you can make it perfectly. And the mathematicians can, why aren't you taking, the, why aren't you criticizing? Me? Why aren't you telling me that this isn't right? Right. I'm, I'm all open. I'm want to hear this. Uh, and see, this is the beauty of, of this. I'm situation. sorry, I'm, I talk frustrated. I don't mean no. to these no, people no. are human beings, just like me. And I don't mean to run anybody down or criticize any doctor or any non-doctor. I don't, I'm not here to, to fight or I'm not here to, I'm trying to help. That's all I'm trying to do. It's a new tool, you guys. It's a new tool. I can show you how congestive heart failure changes the chest dehedron and how it is geometry changes into a, basketball i can show you the geometry yeah i can show you the angles i can show you exactly what it does so that when you see a patient that starts to have uh, a change in the form which i'm all about form if you see the change in the form you can say ah this is heading to the congestive heart failure because this angle right here is changing mm -hmm. so what happens is and the chest of heat goes from a seven-sided form to a six-sided form in congestive heart failure. Why aren't they looking at this? You're, here's the thing. I totally understand where you're coming from in the sense of this, the, it, you know, the frustration of it. Because when you're in the mindset of wanting to help people and people don't want that help, especially in those fields, there's a whole reason for that, in my opinion, um, which I won't even go into. But for the fact of the matter is, on the positive side of it, is yes, maybe they aren't paying attention, but I can assure you being myself included, the people who it actually pertains to in the everyday person who are wanting to take their life back into their own hands, those are the people who are willing to listen more. And that I can assure you of because there's many of us doing this. Um, and that's the beautiful thing that I would say from my experience is maybe yes, those people are knocking at the door, 
But as you said, kind of with the idea of the ideas will come and the math will follow. Well, if the masses are following the ideas and, and the concepts and the uh, undebatable conclusions that you've come to, at a certain point, those people will follow because they are only in business. They are only where they are able to stay if people are coming. And if people aren't coming, well, as you know, they have to adapt. And that's the beauty, I would say on a positive note, because people like myself and friends of mine and those who listen, who uh, is in my community of friends, we like to we like to find the gravy, we like the gravy. Um, it's quite an empowering thing to know that this information is out there and it's now going, all right, we're not gonna go to the mainstream stuff because they aren't, they're leaving stuff out. Where can we find truth? Where can we find where our intuition is going? Yes. And that's- let me, let me give you a thought about the heart. Let's do it. Okay. This is a couple of neat facts. First off, when the baby is <clears throat> from the very start, the embryo, okay, has its own blood. It doesn't have the mother's blood. It has its own blood. Yep. It's not mixed. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, the blood circulates in the embryo, okay, mm -hmm. or before there's a heart. Hmm. There's no heart, and it's circulating, and it's also pulsating. The blood is. no heart. There's no heart yet. The heart's still outside the embryo. Now, <clears throat> when, the, when, the, when the heart goes in, okay, comes into it, then the blood starts to run through it. Now, at the end of life, and when you die, the heart stops, but it's still blood still circulates for a while. Mm -hmm. So is the, is the heart pumping the blood if the blood was pulsating already and turning into a circle before the heart entered the embryo? Is that a pump? No. No. Wow. Wow. You see, the first thing is that the circulation was discovered. Okay, once one of the doctors discovered that there was circulation in the human body, didn't know that before, that there was, it, that blood was circulating in the body. Okay, oh, well, if it's circulating, the heart's a pump. Mm -hmm. And so that's still the idea. That's wild. That yeah, that's wild. Hundreds of years ago. Wow. I mean, and it just goes to show you in the, from the electric standpoint of the body, specifically speaking about the blood that it, you know, we do have iron in our body, which is a conductor of electricity, right? And when you know that the hemoglobin is detaching, you know, from the iron, you have lack of oxygen in your bloodstream, uh, you see what's happening. There's, there's a lack of electricity, which is meaning, as you've made clear and now brought to my mind, if the blood is what's allowing the heart to go through its vortex and expansion, contraction, what you're now experiencing is that the electricity within the blood is what's allowing everything to occur. And as we know, we are electric beings. There's electricity, there's a theory electricity happening all around us. You start to really comprehend for at least me going, wow, as you made clear the blood and how it responds to our three-dimensional world, you start to see what you're experiencing in the world around you, electricity coming in or lack thereof that's supporting you know, the, the electricity or the frequency of nature, you see exactly how that pertains. Hence why they talk about grounding and putting your feet in the sand, getting your feet in the grass and how you're absorbing that electricity into the blood. It's well, I, th I, I think it's really interesting that you <clears throat> have taken this idea that I gave you about the chetahedron and you're applying so something to the blood that makes sense to you. Okay, that's part of what I want. I want people to be able to take and look at this as what's going on in a human being. What does a human being experience? And what a, that's important. That has something to do with the blood in the heart. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, this is this is all up here, kind of a computer. It's all about thoughts and ideas and thinking, yeah. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> you know. It's as, limiting. As great as calculators are today, and so forth, that's basically what the brain does. Mm -hmm. And so you, you then what are you left with? Okay, you're either the thinking world, the feeling world, or the will. This is the will. The feeling will is right here, the heart, mm -hmm. and the thinking world is here. So these three are the basis of what we are, mm -hmm. and what we are trying to find out. You know, we're here to 
to do something. Every person that comes into this world has a job that he wants to do. And he doesn't know what it is because he's not supposed to know what it is. Yeah. He's supposed to find it. And that's what you're doing. And you can look, I'm old guy and I, I am where I'm at, but you're young and you've already got these ideas. You've already got this going on about, about art and science and, and, and the combination of those two and so forth, and more about the heart than anybody else has known based on the geometry. You got, you're in a great position here oh, okay. because you can apply this to any field. This isn't just supposed to be about geometry. This is everything. And I, pre well, I appreciate the kind words, but it, I, I really genuinely couldn't have even been where I am without the, the, the trailblazing that you've done and people like yourself that I've, you know, found inspiration from and found that ability to open my mind to knowing that, oh, wait, that's even a thing. That's a possibility. So I, I, I'm forever, in, you know, grateful for that. And I really appreciate you even taking the time to even talk to people uh, like myself. Um, as you said, you're, uh, you, you know, you're a busy guy. You've been working on this for a long time. You know, I can only imagine it's, that it takes up a lot of time. So, you know, I'm, I am, in, not indebted, but I'm very grateful for our ability to communicate and have this. And um, I will have to wrap up on my end just because I'm gonna have, uh, I have my son here um, and I have to really- So let me just say yeah. one more thing. Let's wrap, I was gonna if say- If you would, if you, if you put this on and you could say, uh, if you have any questions for Frank, send them to me and then I'll come on and you give me these questions you heard and I'll answer them. I was going to say, can, I would be more than happy to have you back on if you were willing. So that's I'm willing. awesome. So what I will do is just that I'm going to stay here, but I will put it in the show notes uh, and on my social media sites and everything saying, we're going to do this again and do exactly that. If you have any questions for Frank, we will cover all of those in our next one. And uh, it, I'm excited for it. But Patrick. Thank you very much, Patrick. Oh, thank you. Frank, where, where can people find you? Where's the best place to find you? And um, uh, I know you- Frankchester.com is my website. Okay. Easy. Just put Frank Chester and it'll come up. Okay. And then all of your lectures, because you, you said you have over 200 lectures. Yeah. Can we find those on your website for those who may not know? Well, you, all you have to go to the YouTube. And okay. uh, my gosh, there are just hundreds. Okay. So, all right. So I will put that in the show notes. And uh, I am very much looking forward to our next one. I hope all of you bring some questions because it's going to be fun because I know I will be bringing a lot of questions. Good. So, I want them. I like awesome. questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Frank. Okay, thank you bye. for everyone who joined us. And we will see you again next time. Have a good one. Bye. bye.